For the more than 30 years, I've known the young Mr. Stephen Wynn. Uh, he has, more than anyone, been able to make something come alive by getting thousands, thousands of people to feel part of the team and to surprise and delight their customers in that interaction. Steve Wynn. Forgive me if I begin by s explaining something that sounds so self-serving, but it, it sets the stage for the point that I want to make. And I, I want to add that I, I'm going to discuss something this morning publicly that I've never discussed before in my career, and something that represents what I consider to be something of an epiphany, uh, a discovery that we made late in our career at my company and which has been the most profound business lesson I've ever learned. And this is the first time I'm going to discuss it. I want to set the stage for this explanation by saying that the, the last building that we built called Wynn Las Vegas is three years old uh, yesterday. It was my wife's birthday and that was the anniversary of the hotel. It opened in 05 on April 28th. It was the first and only hotel in the history of Las Vegas to achieve mobile five-star status. There are 41 mobile five-star hotels in North America. There are 17 mobile five-star restaurants in North America and three mobile five-star spas in North America. There are also, uh, on an order of magnitude of 50 or 60, same thing for food, for hotels, uh, AAA Five Diamond. It's exceedingly difficult to achieve that rating, especially for a large hotel. The 41 hotels uh, the largest one is 260 rooms, and a number of them are less than 20 rooms. Of the 41 hotels that have mobile five-star status, five of them also house mobile five-star restaurants. They are the two Ritz-Carlton's in San Francisco with a restaurant called The Dining Room and the one in Atlanta. And then there's a place called The Inn at Little Washington with one restaurant and 17 rooms and one other... 18 room hotel and then there's us and we have mobile five star status and triple a five diamond status in our restaurants in the hotel and this year michelin came to america and started rating the the european guide highest rating being three stars the michelin guide came to the united states and did hotels in the united states and they did restaurants in new york las vegas and a few other places we're the only building, I think, that has three or four Michelin star restaurants in one building, including the only Chinese restaurant that's a Michelin restaurant. And we've got, we're one of eight hotels in North America that receive five pavilion red, which is the highest rating for a hotel in North America. And there are eight in the United States. I say this because the people that work there have obviously achieved a standard that is notable notable in terms of the fact that there are so many employees. I think we use 7,300, 7,400 FTEs, full-time equivalents. That is, in any 24-hour cycle, we use 7,400 people to run the hotel. The full staff is about 9,000, compared to five or 6,000 in Macau. I mention these numbers and these uh, designations for a reason. I want, I want to make it clear that, for some reason, that we're going to discuss, the people who work at that hotel, and I'm only one of them, have managed to get somewhere that is exceedingly difficult to get. They have managed to strike a note with the public, with anonymous shoppers, with secret shoppers that are deliberately critical. They've managed to impress an enormous amount of people over a period of time and to do so consistently. One other anecdotal thing that I would like to share with you that, I'm, that I think is going to help underscore the point that I've come here to make, uh, and I'm grateful to Mike for the invitation. In, in 04, in March, during Fashion Week in Paris, my wife and my youngest daughter went over to Paris for the week to meet with Lagerfeld and some other people that were going to have stores in our hotel to arrange some special events for the, hotel, for the upcoming opening of the hotel, which was going to be a year later. 
and I happened to drop Elaine and my daughter Jillian off in Paris and went on to Singapore in business. And they stayed at the Four Seasons, the George Sank in, in Paris. And I, I dropped them off at noon uh, from the United States. I left the plane and went on uh, with another form of transportation to Singapore. And I was in Singapore two days later when my wife called me on the telephone and said, you've got to hear this story. You're going to love this story. Jillian, that's my daughter, and I woke up yesterday on our way to go to appointments. We had breakfast in the room, and Jillian ordered a croissant. It was a delicious and rich croissant. She only ate half of it, wrapped up the other half in a saran wrap, left it on the mini bar to eat when we came home at 4 o'clock. We came home this afternoon at 4 o'clock, and the croissant was gone. Jillian said, up, oh, housekeeping took it away. But the message light was on on the telephone. Elaine picked up the phone, pressed the button, the operator said, oh, Mrs. Wynn, I see you're back. Housekeeping would like to talk to you. Elaine was transferred to the housekeeper. Hello, Mrs. Wynn, I'm the housekeeper. We noticed that either you or your daughter left a croissant wrapped in saran wrap on the mini bar, and we assumed that you wanted to eat it later, but we were afraid it would dry out. We took it away, and I lit the light because we, when you came back, we wanted to bring you a fresh one. That was enough to get my wife to call me in Singapore. <laughs> Here is a housekeeper anticipating and thinking about the personal needs of a human being who's staying in the room and using common sense and consideration to make a gesture of that sort. And the next thing you know, my wife is calling me in Singapore because it's an event of such notable characteristic, such a profound impression on my wife that she needed to tell me about it. And as a hotelier and a person involved in the service industry, I was impressed enough to, to take note of the time difference between Singapore and, and uh, to Toronto, and I called Aziz Sharp, the founder, chairman, and cultural father of Four Seasons. I called Izzy in Toronto and said, Izzy, we're friends. I said, Izzy, I got a story to tell you you're just gonna love. Listen to what happened to Elaine at your hotel in Paris. And I told Izzy the story I just related to you, and he lit up over the telephone and said, oh boy, isn't that great? Because to fellows like Izzy Sharp and I, that was, that was the most fundamental affirmation of everything that we ever dreamed about. If you ask me one single thing that would allow me as a businessman to attain total dominance in my business, it wouldn't be that everybody gambled at the hotel. What the hell? A casino is a commodity. Every blackjack table and slot machine is the same as every other blackjack and slot machine. Nobody would walk across the street for one. People are moved by the hospitality, non-casino parts. The, ex the customer experience of going on vacation, that's what moves people. And if you ask Izzy or I, what is the, you only get one wish. Jeannie comes out of the, out of the, the jar, so you get one wish. One single thing that you can have. It would be that my employees would relate to people not as a customer with an employee, but as two human beings talking to one another. Not Mr. Blackjack dealer to Mr. Blackjack player, but Louise with Mr. Jones. If somehow we could harness that energy we could change the history of the enterprise and achieve total market dominance in any service business in the world. 